I don't care who you are, the Bentley Continental GT is a sweet looking car. So like any sane person, I wanted to know what its aerodynamics are like, so I simulated it. But as you'll see, the results are quite surprising, which made me want to try to improve the GT's aero, which we'll see in the second half of this video. But first, the cool original GT. It is a really sleek looking car, something you don't often see with ultra luxury cars. Initially, this is really good for its aero. For example, in past videos, we've seen how the lower front lip is the devil's workshop for flow separation. But Bentley was very clever with this design. You can see that there is definitely a sharp front lip, but the lower part is sloped down and away, which allows the flow to stay attached. It is a very minor point, which makes little difference to the car's look, but a very smart addition. As a result, the flow is fast and low pressure, which is good for downforce. And while this might be a land yacht, it's also a supercar. Over the hood, we have pretty decent flow because it stays attached, and because the hood is so flat, there is little flow acceleration, which means that low pressure zones occur, which means that low pressure zone you typically get here is minimized. That means less lift, which is better for handling. It's almost like a Mustang's hood in that respect. But that flat hood, which is sweet at the front, now creates problems in the windshield. There is a really sharp angle between the hood and the windshield, and that means so much flow crashes into it, dumps its energy, and creates high pressure. Not only does that create more drag, but it also means that for the rest of the car, the flow has less energy to stay attached. For the GT, that's not such an issue because of how sleek the roof and rear window are, but from an aerodynamic point of view, they kind of have to be, unless you want to get a lot of drag. So this hood really limits the options you have. And as we have seen with many other cars, for example the R8, that sharp hood windshield junction also creates very high velocity flow over the front of the roof. Now that in itself isn't a bad thing, but that acceleration also results in low pressure, which increases the lift and reduces the car's handling. I'm quite impressed with the rear window because it is sleek, and an adverse pressure gradient does form, simply because as you go down the rear window, pressure increases. But the boundary layer doesn't grow that much. That is largely because if you look closely, too close, that's better. If you look closely, the rear window isn't actually rounded, but flat. So the flow over it doesn't accelerate or decelerate too much. As a result, the pressure largely doesn't change as you go over it. That minimizes the adverse pressure gradient and hence the badge layer growth. I'm not sure if Bentley did that on purpose, but if they did, then that was very clever, especially considering that this car was designed 20 years ago when car aero was still pretty infantile. The benefit of that is you don't run the risk of separation and the wake will have more energy, which means the drag will drop. I'm really impressed with the underbody, which in this version is simplified, but one aspect that isn't is a diffuser. So the diffuser is good, but it's not as good as it could be. It's not very aggressive, and there's more than enough energy to run this more aggressively. But the thing that is excellent about it is, look how far up the car it starts. Most cars have the diffuser starting well behind the rear wheels. This diffuser starts before the rear wheel. That gives the car so much space to produce continual downforce. So while the diffuser isn't that aggressive, because it is so long, it kind of makes up for that. So the more I see of this car, the more I think the engineers knew aerodynamics very well, and particularly the fundamentals, which is what makes you a great aerodynamicist. That is the center plane. What about from above though? The flow isn't great. This plane is slicing through the wheels, and you can see just how big the wake is. That tells us that the wheel regions are producing so much drag. And one major reason for that is I think the flow can really just go anywhere it likes. You can see the front wheel wakes blowing out and the rear wheel wakes being sucked in. So there isn't much to be happy about in this plane, unfortunately. Maybe a few good things are the front and rear edges are very rounded, which helps pull the flow around and reduce the wakes and drag there. And looking at the vortices, we get a really good appreciation of just how good the top of the car is. And then juxtaposing that with all the vortices from the bottom half of the car. The side mirrors are pretty funny. It's not every day you see such large vortices being created there. In the drag, we can really see how all those vortices and bad flow translate into high drag. Again, the top half is good, but the bottom half of the car is where the trouble is. Another region that is high drag is the chunky rear, which some guys like. So despite much of the car being very streamlined and very well designed, bad regions result in the drag coefficient coming in at 0.36. The lift is pretty bad too, coming in at 15.6 kilos. It's a good thing this car is so heavy. I want to try to reduce that lift figure. To do that, I want to control the wheel wakes more. We saw that they blow out a lot, and that means that the underbody also has to deal with worse flow too. So I'm putting these guide vanes from the front wheels to the rear wheels. The reason why I'm doing that is because you often see on high performance cars and hypercars, guide vanes channeling the front wheel wakes outwards. This among other things means the underbody doesn't have to deal with this dirty flow. So it now has better flow to produce downforce. But then that's about it because no other cars really use these vanes. The downside is that these vanes come with a drag penalty because you are actively making the wake larger. So what I want to do with these straight vanes is not go as aggressively as the hypercar style vanes, but still cordon off much of the underbody from the front wheel wakes. 
I also want to feed that into the rear wheels too, because why do you want high energy flow on them when they're just going to produce drag anyway? Now I have left some gaps around the wheels, so these mains aren't as extreme as they could be, but definitely additions you could put on. They also don't come out all the way to the edge of the GT because this way preserves its look more. How do they perform? Let's see. On the side, we have a huge difference in the wake. It is much smaller, and that is largely because of the float over the diffuser is a little faster. And that's because you don't have as much of the wheel wakes flowing in and dirtying the flow. The rest of the underbody looks pretty similar, so that shows that it takes some time for the wheel wakes to affect the underbody, which makes sense. But the pressure under the diffuser is much lower, so that should really reduce the lift. The rest of the car in this side plane isn't too much affected by these track guide vanes. From on top, the front wheel wakes aren't that different, which tells us that controlling them requires more encompassing vanes and possibly from the front too. The rear wheel wakes are a little smaller though, which is partly because of the slower flow it already had, and the incoming flow is straighter, so there's less initial angularity to the flow hitting them. The guide vanes make the vortices from the front wheels stay closer to the ground, which is exactly the kind of thing that helps the underbody produce more downforce because less of the car is being exposed to dirty flow. So we can see here that exact mechanism. And this might also be another reason why the rear wheels had smaller wakes, because this dirty flow isn't impacting the size of the rear wheels and creating even more wake. From these streamlines, we can see just how much the side flow is being pulled down. Initially, I thought that it was just the jetting vortex from around the contact patch. But as you can see, the entire front wheel flow is being pulled down. And even the flow over the side mirror doesn't pop up as much over the C-pillar. Surprisingly, despite all these changes, the drag isosurfaces don't really change much. The front wheels are pretty bad. The rear has local peaks around the wheels. And then a taper off in the middle. And that is reflected in the drag coefficient, where there's only a few counts difference between these two configurations, which is within the error of the simulation. But the lift is dramatically different. It drops from 15 kilos to 11 kilos, and that is without a drag penalty. So by controlling the weight of the wheels, you can provide fresher flow to the underbody and increase downforce. Peace and amigos.